25, 2011. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Carter, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week we were here talking about jobs. Whoa, get a repairman in to fix this thing. This week we need to talk about jobs again. Because quite honestly, the problem the United States has is we have to get our people back to work. These fine folks had just uh, had the hour before us, so they were talking about jobs. Talking about the ability to get to your job. I, I thought it was an interesting discussion. We are all concerned about jobs, and we all have different views of how they, they should be done, this should be done. The president laid out a, a broad agenda for another stimulus bill that he believes will cause us to have new jobs. And we're gonna, he's going to deliver that, I think, today in writing so we can all sit down and look at it and analyze uh, just exactly what it actually says so we can figure out what, how much of that will create jobs and those who people, if there's a disagreement, will at least know what we disagree with. But the bottom line is there are some things that are basic. <coughs> people, people take their money and they invest their money when they feel like, A, it's going to make them money, and B, that it's going to be, they're going to feel, can feel relatively safe that the future that they envision is a future that's going to actually happen. You've got to look down the road in any organization and make up, get yourself a perspective of just what it takes to make your business or your operation thrive and go forward. And there's some basic things you want to know. You want to know, basically, over, let's say you're doing a five-year plan. Over the next five years, some simple things you'd like to know. What, what's, what are my taxes? What, what taxes am I going to have to pay on my business? What regulations are going to affect my business? And, and are they going to change? Where's the source of, in, uh, of money to borrow or invest in my business if I want to expand? Let's say I want to put a new assembly line in my factory, or I need a new building for my business to grow and, and put my employees in. Am I going to be able to finance that, that building? Am I going to be able to come up with the mortgage money to be able to do that? Am I, do I, can I envision a pathway to income that will support that mortgage and the paychecks of those people that I'm going to hire to run my business with me, to operate the business? These are not mind-shattering things. It's very simple stuff. If you were starting a lemonade stand, you'd have to make some kind of projection on a lemonade stand to figure out whether you were just going to sell lemonade today or maybe you could sell it all week if you're a little kid. But you've got to know what the plan feels about. And tonight, I'm going to talk about the same thing we talked about last night, something that may be unintended consequences. Uh, it may be a different agenda, a bit different view of the world, or whatever you want to call it, but there are very, very onerous regulations that are popping up now and on, on a basically daily basis that are surprising people in industry around the country. The one that is a front page headline and will be the subject of legislation, I believe, this week in Congress is on this board right here. And Congressman Tim Scott of South Carolina has a bill to block this regulation, this action by one of our um, regulatory authorities, the National Labor Relations Board. The National Labor Relations Board has filed a complaint against Boeing to prevent them from, move, from building a new aircraft plant in South Carolina. Boeing currently has a large complex of production in Seattle, Washington, or somewhere in Washington, I think it's in Seattle, Puget Sound it's called. 
<coughs> and the problem that the National Labor Relations Board has with the South Carolina site, which is not going to displace, to my knowledge, any of the union employees that are in Puget Sound, but are going to, it's a new factory with new employees, but because this factory is in a right-to-work state where a person doesn't have to join the union in order to get the salary and benefits that the company pays, the National Labor Relations Board has filed suit against Boeing to prevent them from hiring these people and opening this plant. Now, at a time with over 9% unemployment, close to 10% in some estimate, and as you heard, in some communities, the African-American community, 16 or 18% unemployment, and the Hispanic community in the very same kind of numbers for the Hispanic community, why would, why would a board in Washington, D.C., the National Labor Relations Board, why would they want to say to a company which has made a, a financial determination that the wise place for them to build their next factory is in the great state of South Carolina, but because they are not a union state, they say, no, we're not going to let you build it there. When did it become the government's job to, to have regulatory authorities telling people where they could and could not build a plant based solely on union membership. Uh, this is very, very onerous. It's very, very unfortunate. I, without any argument pro or con to the union membership, this state, which is a sovereign state of our, of our, of our nation, has chosen to have right to work laws, which means you don't have to join the union to go to work. Other states choose to have union laws and close shops. And that, which means that you can't work in a place unless you join the union. Whether you like one version or the other depends on where you stand. But the fact are, facts are that in this country, we have both union shops and right to work states. And I don't think the government should be picking winners and losers. I think it's inappropriate for the government, government to be picking the winners and losers. So that's why Tim Scott is bringing a bill to the floor this week, and I believe it's this week, to discuss this very issue and basically restrict the National Labor Relations Board from having the power to do something like this, because this is not appropriate. The National Labor Relations Board's job is to, to develop the, labor, the relationship between labor and management. It's not a guarantee of union membership. And that's the real, this is the, the reason we're talking about this first and foremost is this is the current event in regulations and government interference in a person's, in a, in a company's business. And by the way, what is a corporation? This is something I've, I'm always amazed. The minute you say the word Boeing Corporation, it's like they become something, some giant something and like it's one, one rich man someplace that owns Boeing. If you own a 401k, if you have a retirement plan, if you have, uh, in, are in, in, involved in even the government investment plan that we have for our federal employees, there's a pretty good chance you might own Boeing stock. Your plan might own Boeing stock. So what is that corporation? Well, it's you if you own Boeing stock, because the owners of that company are the people who own the stock. So we need to realize that it's not one or two rich people that own Boeing. It is a multitude of Americans who have invested a small part of their paycheck in buying a share or 10 shares or a million shares, whatever they can afford, of Boeing stock. So it's, you know, we got this concept that came out of the 60s of it's don't steal from the individual, but steal from, quote, the man in criminal law where I spent my, most of, much of my life. That was always an amazing thing for me. The man seemed to be anybody that you didn't know, but it certainly was the corporations. And yet an awful lot of people have their life savings invested in companies like Boeing, like Shell Oil Company, like Exxon, like United States Steel, if they still exist, I don't know whether they do or not, like Continental Airlines, like American Airlines, 
like Union Pacific Railroad, those are all owned by people. People own those corporations. Why should the National Labor Relations Board tell the representatives of the people that own Boeing stock that they can't be in South Carolina because it's not a union shop? I don't think they should. I think this bill will pass out of this House and hopefully we'll get the support of the President and the realization by the Democrats over in the Senate that this is, a, uh, is an important thing and a very bad precedent for the government to be picking winners and losers. So we started with this board. Now, I talked about my bill that I had, and which we may or may not take up. But this is, well, first off, let me tell you something we've been doing. The National, the Congressional Review Act is in existence at this time and it allows Congress to review every federal regulation issued by the government agencies and by the passage of a joint resolution overrule those, those regulations. Federal agencies shall, that means they must, submit to each House of the Congress, that's the Senate and the House, uh, to the Comptroller General a comprehensive report on the, any major proposed rule. Congress has 60, and that's legislative days, to pass a joint resolution of disapproval of any rule. The Senate must vote on a Congressional Review Act resolution of disapproval. So there is a tool to actually disapprove of some of these, these uh, rules that we're going to be talking about tonight, and we're going to be using that tool. We've already started using it. We're going to continue to use it, so I'm going to put it down here at the bottom. So we remember we've got a tool. <clears throat> People have asked me why I put a bill forward that would be so general as to say, let's have a general regulation moratorium on all regulations till 2013. Let me read you some, this is not an original idea by John Carter, that's me. Uh, this, is, uh, this is some regulations that come, I mean some articles out of some newspapers. Let me just read you a couple of them. The Detroit News. The flood of federal regulations coming out of the Obama administration adds costs, stifles economic growth, and limits job creation. Growth is a smarter way to generate additional taxes from businesses than raising the rates and thus, operating thus, thus the operating costs. The former approach creates jobs, the latter kills them. The business community is also warning that a flood of federal regulations will limit growth and job creation. Obama should suspend implementation of any regulation with potential impact on the economy until unemployment rate falls below 6%. The Environmental Protection Agency in particular must be throttled. The EPA's war on coal affects power plants that provide roughly half of the nation's electricity. In Michigan, DTE Energy says that the new rules will take 20% of its capacity offline within three years. Without an assured supply of energy, companies will not invest in new facilities. <coughs> Excuse me, that's the, that's the um, clip from the Detroit News. The Wall Street Journal, business leaders Quote, stop the implementation of job-destroying regulations. Many of those suggestions are familiar. The CEOs want lower corporate taxes in the U.S., which has among the highest corporate rate in the world, and a moratorium or a rollback of business regulations. The, never, the government needs to be a better partner with the business world, says Magellan, Magellan, I guess that is, Health Services CEO, Renee Lear. Echoing a sentiment expressed by many, James Turley, Chairman and CEO of Ernst Young, removed go government regulation, regulatory policy, un excuse me, removed government regulatory policy uncertainty through 2013 by halt halting initiation or implementation of regulations when such regulations could harm jobs or economic growth. 
So that's just two quotes out of the newspaper. There are more here. But the point of that being is that the people who create jobs, the job creators are the small and mid-sized businesses of this world, and the big businesses for that matter. But the real generator is the small businessman in America. Over 90% of all the jobs held by anybody in this country are held by or those people work for small businesses. Now, what's a small business? Well, the other day we had, sitting up here listening to the president's speech, we had a, a franchise holder for McDonald's franchises. McDonald's Hamburger Place is a small business as it belongs to a person who has purchased the franchise for that business. We had another man with sports clips, which is a, a sports cuts, which is a haircut franchise. And these are individual people who get a national name and a national product, and they pay money for that, for the right to use that national name and national product, and they, but they are a small business, usually run by one or two individuals. And they're telling us the uncertainty of regulatory procedures of the federal government is making their job untenable. I see I'm joined here by my good friend, Mr. Manzullo. I think he might have something to say about this. Don, would you like to, to take the mic? And I'll be glad to yield you whatever time you'd like to have concerning regulations and how they, you see them affecting folks in your part of the world. Well, thank you, Judge Carter, for the opportunity to be with you this evening. I spend, as you know, most of my time working on manufacturing issues. Our congressional district uh, in the northern part of Illinois is home to over 2,000 factories. Uh, and McHenry County, in particular, uh, is home to uh, some of the most high-tech uh, plastic companies in the world. The uh, president uh, last week spoke before Congress and talked about regulations. And he said that every rule should meet the so-called common sense test. Uh, regulation should protect people from environmental and health hazard and unsafe workplace practices. There's no disagreement on that. We all agree on that. But overregulation uh, has a tendency to destroy jobs. Uh, for example, the Department of Health and Human Services, under, under the directive of the National Toxicology Program, has labeled recently styrene uh, as a human carcinogen that causes cancer. Now, styrene uh, is the basic ingredient that is used in plastic composites. Uh, about 90% of the composites contain that. And about 50% of, um, of other plastic, uh, plastic resins are for other uses. And some of the uses for products uh, with styrenes, uh, they're used in um, packaging and disposables under uh, polystyrene plastic resins, uh, food trays, egg uh, cartons, furniture, office fixtures, equipment covers, mail trays, uh, in fact, the, the plastic uh, that is oftentimes used on, um, uh, on electronic equipment, uh, refrigerator components, liners, air conditioning parts and housing, uh, toys, um, high-tech products, consumer electronics, major appliances, insulation, uh, floor backing, uh, pipe and siding, computer monitors, um, IV connectors, syringes, stereo covers, you can see that it's, 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 it's almost anything uh, that is used um, in, in manufacturing and uh, the, 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 the fiberglass tubs, showers. The gentleman would, lay, yes. would yield. I believe this board's made out of that styrene. Could be, could be. This is a plastic board. Uh, could be. A pl what could, we call plastic board. Could, could very well and be. If you look at it, it probably is made out of styrene. And so it, it's, that just demonstrates, uh, uh, Judge, the, the fact that, that styrene is, is so pervasive in all of our consumer products. Now, what has happened is the National Toxicology Program uh, said that styrene is a carcinogen. They looked at a couple of studies, did a very, very poor job in looking at the history and the other studies available. In fact, the European Union and Canada came to the opposite conclusion and said that, that uh, there's nothing wrong with styrenes, that it does not cause cancer. What we're trying to do is get the National Academy of Sciences, um, which is widely regarded as a final word in these scientific matters, to conduct an independent study on styrene. 
Now, if nothing happens and styrene remains on this list of something that's, quote, likely to cause uh, cancer, it could end up destroying hundreds of thousands of jobs in America. Let me give you an example. The company that makes all the plastic utensils for McDonald's, that company uses styrenes. And what we see developing here uh, are insurance companies that are taking a look at the, at the plastic companies that use styrene, and they're becoming very nervous over the fact that the government has taken a position that without good case study, that styrene is a carcinogen. So insurance companies are starting to balk to insure the styrene uh, companies that use styrene. Lawyers have already met uh, examining the best way that they could bring the class action lawsuits uh, for all these uh, products that contain styrenes. And what could end up happening is because of the regulations that will come down from the federal government, the government will say, well, in its fi finished product, there's nothing wrong with a product involving styrenes, but in the manufacturing of it, that's where the problem is. We could lose hundreds of thousands of jobs. Our plastic industry could be destroyed. Now, th these are the types of things that absolutely do not make sense, where because of the, uh, the jungle of rules uh, that the federal government has that makes it very difficult to get in a counter argument uh, where people make decisions uh, not based upon a cost analysis, but based upon a couple of studies here and there as opposed to volumes of studies that have gone on examining whether or not styrenes are carcinogen. We could lose the plastics industry in America. Those jobs could easily go overseas, all because of poor science on the part of the regulators. Regulation in America is out of control. And I work not only with the styrene industry, but the people that are involved um, in, in foundries, uh, where uh, regulations are underway, that if they're not done correctly, I could take a look at the silicas and say, and even though silicas are a problem, we know that if the regulations are done improperly, we could lose the foundry industry in this country. America is great because of our manufacturing background. America will only recover from this economic crisis when the manufacturing jobs are secure and come back. And that's why we've been pleading with HHS. Said, you don't understand, the Department of Health and Human Services, the impact of the poor decision that you have made with regard to these styrenes. And we could go on to other products from other, corp other um, manufacturers. And it's, it's a slew. You have up there in the chart uh, the scissors cutting the red tape. The red tape is so thick it would take a blowtorch to go through it or some kind of a chopper or, or buzzsaw besides the, the scissor on it. So I, um, I share with you the concern, the deep concern over the people who are losing jobs in America today because of overregulation by the federal government. And recapturing my time, I thank my friend and say that I hope that all those members of this House and others that might be listening heard you say America could lose this industry. It didn't say that the world would lose this industry because, quite honestly, once again, a great industry that produces good paying jobs will all of a sudden, not because of taxes or not because of high labor costs, which a lot of the arguments we get, a new factor. The regulatory agency drove this prosperous in, in, industry out of our country because of possibly voodoo science, that they didn't investigate enough. They do, they've got a concept and they stick to that concept on their science arguments and they don't, they've got, they don't go outside the, the, the scope of their, their view of the world. 
and they're going to shut down an industry. But are we going to stop making plastics? No, the world's not. Just the, the United States is going to stop. That's correct. That's correct. And that's why. And then people say, why are all these shop, these jobs offshore? It's not just the cost of labor that drives people offshore. Our regulatory agencies, agencies have as much to do with that as anything there is out there. The president made a joke recently where he said he found out that all shovel-ready jobs are not shovel-ready jobs. Well, let me tell you, I haven't checked all those jobs he's talking about, but I'd be willing to bet you that there's either an endangered species or the in some form or fashion the Environmental Protection Agency is in between the shovel taking the first load of dirt on a project and, and somebody trying to get a project done. Because it's the agencies that are shutting down our highways, they're shutting down our bridges, they're shutting down our sewer projects, our water projects, and sometimes for very bizarre reasons. Would the, would the gentleman yield? I certainly do yield back. And, and look at the Keystone Pipeline uh, coming down from uh, Canada uh, to Texas with branches really into, into, into central Illinois. It's been tied up by the, by the EPA and other regulators for three years. We're looking at uh, 20,000 new jobs. Uh, I think it's a five to eight billion dollar project. Uh, that doesn't count the people that make the pizzas, uh, the people that uh, make the, 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 the shoes. Uh, I was talking to a, a shoe salesman, uh, Red Wing Shoes, uh, that are mostly made in America. And he, those are the, the industrial shoes. And I said, how's business? And he said, Don, he said, when manufacturing is down and construction is down, my sales of shoes are down. Sure. And so it's a, uh, uh, it continues. It, it's not just the cost, the actual cost of the impact to that particular um, uh, entity, the particular construction site, the particular regulation, but all the peripherals that come as a result of it, those are the things that destroy our economy. Yeah, you, taking back a little time here, just to, to continue this conversation, I think it's very interesting what you said about the, the pipeline. That pipeline is bringing heavy crude from Canada to the United States to be refined. Now, let's just point out that it was in the Wall Street Journal less than, less than sometime this week, as I read it this week, that Alberta, Canada is just exploding. Everybody's got these great jobs because they are developing, they're going forward, their environmentalists are staying out of the way, and they're developing this heavy crude industry, this tar they've got up there, these tar sands, and that's what we're shipping down here to be refined in this proposed pipeline down to where the market is in the United States. Well, Canada is one of our largest, if not the largest, single exported to the United States of petroleum products. Now, what's interesting about this picture is that same field that's across that imaginary line in Canada is also down in North Dakota, and we know it's there. It's in Montana, and we know it's there. And it's probably in a lot of other places that are called, quote, public lands in this country right now. Those are lands held by the federal government. They own those lands. Now, what does that mean? That means that they're not letting the drilling going on or the exploration go on our land for the same petroleum products that we're buying from Canada and building a ship, a pipeline to ship down here. Why? EPA and others. Regulators and bureaucrats are preventing the development of those products. Now, it all goes back to the global warming or climate change argument or all whatever, whatever this whole big umbrella that is over this whole, whole idea. But you wonder why there's no jobs. 250,000 jobs have been created in Alberta, Canada in the last 18 months. 250,000 jobs, all doing with that oil. Right across the border, we could be doing the same thing. And it's not just oil, it's, it's natural gas. Natural gas, it's natural gas. And I'll tell you something else, I was just down in San Antonio meeting with some uh, friends down there. One of them was a banker. He said, go to South Texas, man. You should see what's happening in South Texas. They have found that there's, besides the oil and gas we'd already found many years ago down there, they have now found out that the shale oil, there's shale oil and shale gas down the ground, amazing deposits down there. They're going to have to be using the fracking system to get it out. 
But already they're building hotels in towns that only have 8,000 people in them. They're building four-story hotels. Why? Because the foreseeable future, working men and women are going to be in those hotels because they've got a job there until they can find a place to live. Builders are already looking at, what, at developing subdivisions. And everyone, the people who are selling work books, boots are selling work boots in South Texas. And all those periphery things that come off of that discovery and that development of that discovery creates thousands and thousands of jobs. It multiplies as it goes, just exactly as you were, uh, as you were describing, Mr. Manzillo. And, and that's the exact kind of progression that will bring this country back. If, our, if we let those folks continue to manufacture and the new product, I guarantee you there's not a person that's watching this or listening to this or is in this chamber that there's not somewhere almost within their reach something that's made out of the styrene that you've just been describing to us. It is almost as, as abundant as wood. In fact, if you remember the old movie, uh, The Graduate, what was it he said? The, the guy gave the kid it's plastic. That's the future, plastic. Well, we're in that future now. And it is, it is the future. In fact, one of the reasons our, we have such an outstanding medical world that we live in is we're not having to rewash and sterilize metal and glass instruments where you, we're making these, all of our instruments out of this plastic with that styrene in it, and then we're throwing them away. They're disposable. We can make them at a price that we can dispose of them for health purposes, which has changed the lives of many thousands and thousands of Americans in this country every single day. The health pluses of having that product on the market. But with the government's interference, we'll be getting it from China or India or, or who knows where, but it won't be from here. And no American will have a good job on that. It's, it's almost criminal. Plus, you back. Well, plus we would, we would end up losing uh, the people that made the, the machine tools, uh, the mold, the actual molds, the dyes uh, for the injection systems and other types of systems uh, and molding systems that are used um, in the manufacture of these plastics. But I appreciate the uh, Congressman Carter yielding to me for a few minutes to, uh, to explain this styrene issue and look forward to the rest of your presentation. Well, thank you. I thank you for joining me. And if you'd like to stay, we'd love to have you. Going back to another quote, CNBC CEO, from a regulation standpoint, government just needs to get out of the way. We asked several CEOs leading up to the speech what bold steps Obama could take to reduce the 9.1% unemployment rate. John Schiller, chairman and CEO of Energy 21, said if the government would get out of the way from a regulation standpoint and let us, 21, do what we uh, do good, you'll see us continue to hire and grow this economy. I think that's the message from across the board, said Schiller. From the Washington Examiner, if President Obama was serious about boosting job creation, he would stop his administration from creating even more regulatory uncertainty. This is the president who once blithely quirped, you know, the business community always complain, is always complaining about regulations. But Friday's decision can only be viewed positively if it is indeed a first step. There are still six other proposed regulations from the EPA that would cost the economy dearly. According to the EPA's own estimates, the cost to small business, business for obtaining carbon emissions permits alone would be $76 billion per year, not including the hundreds of billions of dollars in widespread economic damage from higher energy prices. If Obama really wanted to remove regulatory uncertainty from the economy, he would use his Thursday job speech, that was last Thursday, to announce that he is ordering the EPA Administrator, Lisa Jackson, to halt all her agency's work on global warming regulations. Now, these are just some quotes from some of the media out there that are talking about job creation. 
I'm for a moratorium. We'll see if we can get that done. Red tape reality. The White House promises to save $10 billion in five years. The White House just put forward $17.7 billion in regulations in only, 17, in only two months. Next one. Thank you. This is uh, something we call the Train Act. What the, the purpose of the Train Act is very simple. Transparency and regulatory analysis of impacts on the nation, train. These guys sit up late at night to figure out that, how they can have an, an acronym to cover whatever they're doing. But this is very simple. Train dele delays Boilermac and Caspar, these are two huge rulemaking issues, which we'll talk about. I'll tell you about in just a minute. Until the full impact of the Obama administration's regulatory agenda has been studied. They basically say a thousand power, a thousand power plants are expected to be affected. The annual electricity bill increases in many parts of the country from 12 to 24 percent. Now what is this? The administration's new maximum achievable control technology standards and cross-state air pollution rule for utility plants will affect electricity price prices for nearly all American consumers. A total of 1,000 plants are expected to be affected. Middle-class Americans can expect their bill to go up between 12 and 22 percent. Mr. Sullivan is saying, look, let's make an economic analysis before you actually impose these regulations. See what it's actually going to do. How is it going to hurt the individual consumer? And how, how, by the way, is it going to hurt the ability of people to get a job? If you're going to shut down, in some instances, up to a third to a half of power plants, because they're either coal emission power plants or because they, they, they've got boiler issues that have got to be de dealt with, then what happens? You're talking about people's jobs getting laid off. Those, you know, there's some, that, when it comes to coal-powered plants, there's some places where the majority of the electricity in the Midwest, for instance, is coal-powered. Now, if you're going to shut down coal-powered plants to make them retool for new regulations, which, here's an interesting thought, they've already retooled and put scrubbers on these things three or four times. It's another set of retooling on top of the retooling before the retooling and the other retooling. Then they get, and when they get to this thing and they get finally, at some point, the guy's going to say, my gosh, I think I've had about all this regulation I can stand. Now, I'm going to tell you an amusing story, but it's true. When I was a young lawyer, I worked for the Agriculture Committee of the Texas House of Representatives as their lawyer. Uh, and uh, we had a hearing one day about new federal regulations on sausage manufacture. Now, Texas is, uh, our heritage has a lot of folks from the sausage manufacturing parts of Europe. We have Germans, we have Czechs, we have Swedes, uh, we have Norwegians, we have a lot of people who in their old country, they made sausage. And so we have lots and lots of small sausage operations in Texas. Almost every town you go to in Texas, some butcher shop somewhere is making their own best sausage made in Texas. And it, you can go to our grocery store and you'll see sausage that's produced, I'm just talking about Texas now, in multiple cities all over the states. Most of them are small towns. Now, this is a true story. We have, we're having a testimony about new government regulations concerning the manufacture of sa sausage by small businesses. And they brought a man in who was in a prison uniform from the state prison in Huntsville. And they put him on the stand and they said, why are you here? He said, well, my brother and I, we, had, we made the best, best sausage in East Texas. But we got this guy, this guy came in our office and he said, I got these regulations here. 
You're not going to be able to make this in your butcher shop anymore. You're going to have to redo your butcher shop. They gave us a list of stuff we had to do. We took it to our banker. He said, you boys got the best sausage operation in East Texas. I'll loan you $25,000. You can do the fix your place up. So they put in tile floors with drains, and they put in different butcher blocks and this, that, and the other. And he said, nah, we, we borrowed $25,000, and he said about eight months later, that same old boy came through the door. He said, I got some bad news for you, gentlemen. We got new regulations. All that stuff you had to do last time, it's not good enough. Everything's got to be stainless steel. You got to have a cement floor with a power drain in it. You got to have certain kinds of saws. And said, so me and my brother, we went to the banker and we said, hey, what are we going to do? He said, well, that's another 50000 but you're good. You got a great business. I'm going to loan you that $50,000. You boys do the work. So we did the work. And it was working great. We were manufacturing sausages. We still made the best sausages in East Texas. He said, and then that same old boy came walking in our door, and he said, I got bad news for you, boys. He said, and that's when I shot him. Now, that's a true story. And he was serving time for manslaughter in the penitentiary for shooting that regulator. I'm not, I'm not in any way advocating shooting regulators. I'm telling you how frustrated a small businessman can get just for regulations on the manufacture of sausage in his hometown butcher shop. Now think how, how, how frustrated that an employer gets when a regulation causes him to lay off one third of his workforce to afford to do what he's doing. Uh, this, is the, this is the whole concept of why regulations are so, have to be so carefully planned and done and you have to have good studies done as to the economic effect. As John Sullivan, from o my friend from Oklahoma, has cut, brought before this house. <coughs> this is called the EPA Regulatory Relief Act. This has to do with Boiler Mac. Hospitals, factories, colleges, thousands of major American employers use boilers that will be impacted by the EPA's new Boiler Mac rules. These new stringent rules will impose billions of dollars in capital and compliance costs, increase the cost of many goods and services, and put over 200,000 American jobs at risk. The American forest and paper industry, for example, will see an additional burden of at least five to seven billion dollars. Mor uh, Morgan Griffin of Virginia has, has this bill, which provides le a legislative stay of the four interrelated rules issued by EBA EPA this March, of the March of this year. This legislation would pr also provide EPA with at least 15 months to repropose and finalize new uh, regulations that are achievable and do not destroy jobs and provide employers with the ability to extend compliance on these rules. These rules as they stand are business-killing rules today. 200,000 people will lose their jobs if these rules are implemented. And this will be brought up in October, around the 3rd of October, and that week, to, to, to basically put a hold on these job-killing uh, regulations. The president himself said, we need to examine regulations and see how they're going to kill jobs. Well, here's one right here, Mr. Mr. President, 200,000 jobs at a minimum will be lost, maybe forever, and cost of five to seven billion dollars in just one industry. Now, that's money that's capital is have been put into a different project than, than building and expanding your business. And that means instead of hiring people, you're laying off people. Now, why in the world, in the environment where we have 9%, 9.1% unemployment, we've been teetering around 10% now for almost a year, why in the world would we want to have these people who work for us in the government, they're not elected, they're appointed people, they're hired, just like anybody else, 
that are out there thinking up ways to shut off people, good, good honest, hardworking men and women in this country's jobs because of some concept they have on making an improvement. Let's make improvements. Let's keep our environment clean, but let's do it in a way that remembers that we're part of the environment too. Let me check what, how much time we got left. Fifteen. Yes. Sir. Thank you. This is something I've worked on. I've worked on it now for almost six months. This is the cement, and John Sullivan is doing. It, who has been working with us on this, is uh, bringing this up that week of October third. The cement Mac. Are, and two related rules are expected to affect approximately 100 cement plants in America. Now, when we say cement, we're talking about a process that makes that powder and gravel and sand that you, if you go to the, to the I won't advertise for anybody, but if you go to one of these stores that sells uh, stuff for construction, you'll see these sacks of stuff that say something Crete, cement Crete or something in it. And in that sack is a bunch of stuff, and you add water to it, and you make concrete. Okay, and I, I, gardeners use it. Everybody uses it. On a bigger scale, you pour slabs for, for foundations for buildings. On an even bigger scale, you put special reinforced steel in, the, in the, 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 the cement pour, the concrete pour, and you make pre-stressed pre concrete walls, which most of our big buildings in this country and around the world are built with. In fact, concrete is the number two building material in the world. The number one building material in the world is water. So we, you, the, of, of the elements that are used in building things, Portland cement is number two. And it's the process that makes the powder that binds it to make concrete. Now we, this is our process. We discovered it, we did it, we originated the, the pre-stressed concrete that, they, that many of these buildings here in Washington, D.C. Are, that aren't marble are built out of. And, and yet, our regulatory process has the potential to drive anywhere from a third to a half of all the, the cement manufacturers, the people that make the powder that binds the concrete, out of the country. Now we're doing it for the good of the environment, right? Well, we've got scrubbers on our cement plants and we've got lots of things we have cleaned up in our cement process, but our competitors in China and India have nothing. I mean, zero. They don't have anything to do with cleaning up the environment. So is it really gonna clean up the world's, all the way around the world's environment? by taking it away from a place that does it right and put it in a place that does it wrong. But a $7 billion industry could cost as much as $5 billion to fix these regulations. Put a pencil to that. I mean, they, they're worth $7 billion and $5 billion more have to be put into it. It, it, and the, the only solution that many of them see is just close down the plants in the United States, fire the people that are there. And oh, what kind of jobs are these? Lowest paid man that works at a Portland cement factory makes around $65,000 a year, laborer. And then the technicians get up in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. These are not, these are not minimum wage jobs. These are the kind of jobs that every American dreams about. The kind of jobs that every family dreams is the basis of their family. And because of the regulatory analysis of some people that, that have made, they have decided that they're going to impose regulations that basically drive these people off, off to Mexico or to, to China or to India. And they bring up issues like mercury. But studies, their own people's studies show that the majority of the mercury that's in the air right now in the United States comes from China and India. Because they don't clean things up over there and it blows over here from China and India. 
So we'll make it better by sending more over to China and India? I don't think so. But what about the American jobs that are here? What if they let these people thrive? If they thrive, building materials stay reasonable. <coughs> We're not having to ship building materials from China to build our next house, to pour our next concrete slab. And so what happens? Price of everything goes up. Can we afford that next house? Who knows? This is what regulations do. It is a compounding effect. It costs us jobs. I see one of the smartest men in, con men in Congress here, Mr. Gomert over there. Is he here to talk <coughs> on a different subject? Well, I know you're smart enough to talk about this one if you want to. Louis is one of my colleagues from Texas, and I'm, I'm proud to call him my friend. Let's go to the next one. <coughs> Well, we don't even have a board for this, but let me say something. I was telling you about South Texas and the jobs that they're creating down there. Just to give you an example of how excited people are about that find of natural gas in South Texas. Now remember, Texans are all and gas people. Remember this too. When Texas came in the Union as a country, we had a special treaty which kept, let us keep our public lands. So the federal government doesn't tell us what we, we do with our land in Texas because we own our public lands. And all this land that's going to be drilled on in South Texas is owned by people, not by the federal government. So they can't keep us from leasing our land out to drill these wells. Now, they can keep us from using the process it takes to break up that shell to capture this gas. And that's what they're trying to do. Now, we, have, we created an energy department in this country, I forget, 30 years ago. And its, its goal was to make us in energy independent in our lifetime. Well, I don't know whose lifetime it was, but some of those people are already dead. Because the truth is, we're farther from being energy dependent than the day they created the energy department. Way farther. At that time, less than 30% or 40% of our, of our uh, oil and gas came from overseas. Now we're in the 80% percentile range. Now, why in the world, when we know that we've got it, and we know we're going to use it, we have to use it, why would we keep buying it from Saudi Arabia and, and places like that hate us, like uh, Venezuela and other places? Why don't we just get what we got? Go down there and get what we got. Out in the Gulf and in South Texas and in the great state of Pennsylvania where they've got a huge shale oil find, shale gas find. They got a huge, and ask those people how, how they like that. Shale gas. They love it. 25,000 jobs have been created in that part of Pennsylvania in the last year and a half. The, the same shale goes into New York, and it's going other places. So there are jobs that gets created by this. But here's another peripheral thing, because there's no place to stay in South Texas. So we're just a bunch of little bitty towns down there. Big hotel firms are coming down there and building hotels down there, because they see this to be a long-term operation down there and it's worth them investing in building hotels and motels so the people who are working down there will have a place to stay. What comes with that? Restaurants. What comes with that? Washeterias and all the other things that you need to, to, to have people grow. And then when the people settle, what's the first thing they're looking for? An apartment or a house to live in. They get tired of staying in a hotel. One company, I won't use their name, one company went down to South Texas and leased a whole eight-story hotel for two years. That's how convinced they are this is going to be an economic boom in South Texas. Why would we ever want to stop that? And yet, there are people who are continuously bombarding the, the, this industry and saying that this terrible shale fracking process is poisoning the water supply. But there's no evidence, real evidence, that proves that. And by the way, anybody that tells you they can smell it in their water don't know what they talk about because natural gas doesn't smell. It smells in your house because they put a chemical in there that makes it smell. So you can know when your gas is leaking. But it doesn't smell when it comes out of the ground. I've worked in that industry as a kid. 
I had the, the crummy job of actually digging up one of those smell machines that puts a smell in natural gas, and I can testify under oath. It's the foulest smelling stuff you ever saw, but, you, but they have a machine that puts it in your gas so you can smell it when it goes into your home. So there's a lot of people that are, that are just being crazy over some of these issues. Look at this, coal. First of all, I was talking to the, tonight at supper with one of our members from Kentucky, and he said they've issued two coal, coal mining pipe permits in the last two years, I think he said, in, in a, one of the largest coal mining areas in the entire country. They're, there's everything, they're doing everything they possibly can to kill the coal industry, and yet we have an abundance of coal, and clean up the coal process has been the goal of the coal industry in the power manufacturing world, we have some states like Ohio, Michigan, Kentucky, those things along the Ohio River, those states there, and many of the states on the East Coast, and even this city, have coal power plants. In fact, the predominant, in some places, the predominant power plant is a coal power plant. Now, if they shut those down and take them offline, how are we going to have enough electricity for everybody? We already worry about brownouts and blackouts when we have hot weather. How are we going to have the electricity if we're going to take away the natural resources? And who's going to take it away? A vote of this Congress? No. We've had that vote. It didn't happen. A guy who works for the government that sits in his little office in a cubicle and, do, and, and decides that he doesn't think we ought to have coal, can he write, should he be able to write, he and a group of people be able to write a regulation that shuts down that whole industry based on possibly bad science? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. And do we all want to sit around in the dark as we ponder it? Because if we shut off the, the, what we use to power our power industry, we won't have any, any electrical power. This is for the residuals. <coughs> I guess it's the ash is the best word I can say. Now, what in the world is anybody worried about coal ash for? Well, I think everybody in this room, if they don't have sheetrock in their house, they something probably strange about it because most everybody has what we in our part of the world call sheetrock. Now up here they may call it wallboard or something else. Well sheetrock, part of the component of sheetrock is coal ash. And yet there's a regulation that creates an enforceable minimal, minimal standard for the regular, this, this bill creates an enforceable minimal, minimal standard and allows coal ash to be used in the products it's being used in with, approximate st with appropriate studies. If they do the pending rules for coal ash, there's another thousand jobs that's going to be lost. So just in our talk tonight, we've got, there's 300,000 jobs. We, we're almost through this stuff. And there's plenty more. I've just got 10 of the hundreds that have been passed in just the last two months of new regulations. These are just 10. But in these short 10, at now we're at over 300,000 jobs lost when these regulations will go into effect. And most of these are current events. This will happen before the end of the year or certainly before the middle of next year. So as we are trying to create jobs, we're losing them as fast as we can create them. And how, why? Because of regulations. Now, we can regulate without shutting things down. There's a smart way to do things, and there's a stupid way to do things. Let's do it the smart way. Let's get the politics, and by politics I mean the environmental politics, out of, the, this, out of this, this process, and let's get off to where we need to be, and that is, what do we need, how do we accomplish it, and how do we keep people working while we do it? If we can do that, which is certainly not flying to the moon, it's less, less complicated than that. If we can do that, we can start solving the job problem we've got in this country because we can put people back to work. I'll give you one final example that we don't have a board on. I'm not going to use the last board. <clears throat> we talked, I talked earlier about people who, who have franchises. Well, if you wanted to buy a McDonald's hamburger franchise for your hometown, I don't know what it costs, but it's not cheap because it's a money-making business. And when you bought it, you'd be a small business owner. You'd own one McDonald's store. 
I think that'd be a pretty good definition of a small business owner. Now, we have written the regulation. There's more pages in that regulation than there are chairs in this room. It's called the Dodd-Frank Bill, and it regulates the, the financial industry. And as a result of the Dodd-Frank Bill, if you were wanting, if you had the ability and the credit worthiness to get the money, to get, a, get the bar the, the investment money and put up some of your own to buy a McDonald's franchise, the Dodd-Frank Bill has put so many regulations on these folks that, is, that the availability of capital, and capital is not a dirty word, capital is another word for investment money, the availability of capital for these small businesses is almost impossible. And yet our banks are overflowing with capital. And it's not that they don't want to make loans. It's first, small businessmen are scared of this environment and they don't want to borrow. But if they do want to borrow, the regulations have made it so difficult, they, they give up and they don't borrow the money. Bankers don't make a living if somebody doesn't borrow the money. That's how they make a living. So it's all, everything in our economy is interrelated and tied together. As we talk about small business, it is the driving force of American economy. If you keep small business from creating new jobs, you keep our economy from growing. These regulations and others we'll talk about in the future are just that, job-killing regulations. And if they've killed existing jobs, they're certainly not going to be helpful. In the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the time that you gave me tonight. I yield back whatever's left. Under the Speaker.